Hi guys, in this video I am going to talk about a parasite that we don't see very much of in the U.S. but has actually kind of cleared entire villages in its endemic areas, and that's Onchocerca volvulus. Onchocerca volvulus um, is like some of the other organisms we've talked about. One, it's a parasite. And beyond being a parasite, it's also a worm. So as you can see here, um, and it's considered a nematode. Nematode. So that kind of tells us a couple of things about its structure already, which you can go back and look in pre previous cases and previous videos. Um, the most important thing about Onchocerca volvulus is actually what it causes. It's the main cause of a disease called river blindness. Um, and where it is endemic, people will actually move away from the river just to avoid this. And it's not that the river is giving it to them, it's that the flies that hang out near the river are what are transmitting it. So this is a vector-borne illness. Um, much like we talked about with previous organisms, um, particularly like malaria, and then we're going to talk about a lot of vector-borne viruses when we talk about some of the encephalitic viruses, which are obviously spread by vectors. Okay, so most of this I said already. The only thing I didn't say already is that um, the vector for this is just the black fly. So this black fly will land on the skin and bite the skin, and um, there actually is a life cycle within the black fly as well for this parasite, um, and that's how you know it's a truly vector-born um, or an arbo-born, because this is an arthropod-born illness. Um, as with all parasitic infections, you absolutely have to know the infective and the diagnostic form. Um, and so there are two different forms for this one. The infective form is the larval worm and the diagnostic form is the microfillary. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the cycle of disease. And with that, we can talk a little bit about the life cycle of Oncocera, um, Cerca. So basically you have an infected black fly that's gonna start the cycle. So when the fly bites, it's gonna deposit the larva onto the skin and the larva are gonna enter the wound that the fly makes when it bites you. So basically when it gets in there, the worms are gonna migrate from the skin to the subcutaneous tissue. And that's where they're actually going to develop into adult worms. The adult worms are gonna develop here and then they're gonna mate and produce these microfilariae, um, which are basically just immature worms. It's a really fancy way for saying immature worms. And they do this at an exhausting rate. A female worm can produce almost a thousand microfilariae a day. Um, so thousands of these immature worms are going to migrate through the skin causing kind of a variety of um, symptoms which we'll go through in a minute but you can see rashes you can see deep pigmentation and kind of the most common is for them to um, go and infect the actual eye itself which is what leads to river blindness now remember this is a vector transmitted disease so if it's a vector transmitted disease there are also stages in the black fly so when a black fly bites an infected host like if this guy um, well, actually, I guess let's start down here. This guy comes over and feeds on the blood of this poor woman that is infected with Onco, then it's actually going to replicate within the salivary glands of the black fly. So it actually, it takes a pit stop in the mid gut, but then it shows back into the salivary glands of the fly. And then when the fly bites a new host, it deposits um, the larvae onto the skin of the new host. So remember, that's kind of key for all vectors is that it's actually able to infect the arthropod as well as us. So we don't tend to see Onco in the United States, thankfully, um, but it is actually endemic to many parts of Africa. Um, and it's also found in the Congo and the Volta River basins. Um, and you can see we, all, we see it in South America. There's some cases in um, Mexico each year. So there is kind of this section of the world where it's very, um, very common. And there's about 18 million cases of Onco each year. Um, and it causes blindness in about 5% of um, infected people. So this is not uncommon. Um, so how does it actually cause disease? Well, 
As I mentioned before, you get infection of the skin that leads into the subcutaneous tissues, but you can also get infected of infection of the lymph nodes and the eyes. And the clinical manifestations of the infection are pretty much due to the acute and chronic inflammatory reactions to not just the antigens of the worms, but also the worm's own parasite. That's right, we're talking about a parasite on a parasite. So this particular um, worm, Onco, as I lovingly call it, has its own little hanger on, and that's Wolbachia. Um, these are basically bacteria, bacterial endosymbionts. So just like we have um, bacterial organisms that live in our gastrointestinal tract, um, Onco does too. Um, so what happens is as the worms die off, we make an immune response not just to the worm, but also to its bacterial microbiota, basically. And that can also lead um, to inflammation. The other thing that happens is that as the worms mature and produce um, immature worms, you're going to see subcutaneous nodules appear on any part of the body that they're there. So let's first talk about river blindness because it is kind of the most common thing that we associate it. Um, like I said before, whole villages might leave the area near streams and farmland that could produce food just to avoid the disease. Um, so what happens is you get the worm, right? And then let's say you get a nodule here or on your neck, so anywhere on your head and neck. And what happens is as the microfilari are produced, they migrate to the eyes where they can cause tissue damage leading to blindness. Um, ocular disease is thought to be due not just to the microfilari, but also to the Wolbachia, bacterial endosymbionts, which are literally just bacterial organisms that are living inside the worm. So these bacteria can be released after the worm dies in the cornea, and it'll lead to corneal edema and um, the opacity that we're seeing here. Um, and basically what happens is that you're inducing trafficking of neutrophils and macrophages into the area. And all of this inflammation is really bad for the eye. And you can see this is kind of the stuff of nightmares, right? This, this worm just coming out of the person's eye. Um, so you're seeing this mass inflammation that's leading to disease there. You can also get skin infections, obviously, because that's where it starts. I don't have a picture of that here, um, but really it just leads to a loss of elasticity and areas of depigmentation. De you can see a little bit of it here that you've got some hyperpigmentation or some depigmentation, and you can also get thickening of the skin um, kind of around um, where the infection is, as well as atrophy. The other thing that sometimes happens as a result of infection is basically elephantiasis. And basically what happens is you have these nodes that develop near the genitalia and they produce a phenomenon known as hanging groin. So you can see here, you've got the loss of elasticity um, and kind of the atrophy in the skin here that's basically allowing the um, groin to basically hang um, from the weight of these nodules. Okay, so how are we going to diagnose it? Um, so you can diagnose it a couple of ways. You're first going to find the immature worms in the skin, and this is done by doing a skin snip um, from the infrascapular or gluteal region. Um, basically, the way you do this is you have a sample that you take by raising the skin with a needle and then shaving the epidermal layer with a razor. So it's fairly simple. Um, ocular disease can actually be diagnosed, um, so you're not going to take a snip of somebody's eye, um, but you're going to use a um sorry, a slit lamp, a slit lamp to basically um, look through the eye and see if you can identify the worm within the eye. If you can do that, then that's pretty um, diagnostic. You can do serology, but remember with serology, it's always, you know, a double-edged sword. If you see IgM, that's a good sign. If you see IgE, they might have had it before and cleared it. It's hard to know. Um, you can also do PCR, and obviously you would do PCR from your skin sip, uh, snip preparation. Okay, so how are we going to treat it? Well, first things first, get rid of those nodules because the nodules are full of immature worms. So you're going to do some sort of surgical removal of the nodules, um, getting rid of all of those encapsulated um, organisms. Um, that's going to prevent further production of the immature worms. You can also do ivermectin. Um, so endemic areas, if you actually gave one single dose of ivermectin every six to 12 months, you could actually prevent um, infection throughout the area. It's kind of amazing. So if we just used ivermectin everywhere, we could probably prevent this. However, anytime you say a single drug, you always have to be worried about resistance mutations, right? 
There is also some evidence to suggest that doxycycline could be helpful, but in this case, the doxycycline isn't actually treating against onco. What it's actually treating against is the Wolbachia, the um, parasite within the parasite, right? The bacterial organism that's living inside the parasite that we make a response to. Um, so you can reduce the Wolbachia bacterial infection, and it does have a little bit of a an effect against onco where it can actually sterilize these immature worms before they get a chance to reproduce. That's all I have on onco and stay tuned for more parasitic videos soon.